Hello everybody, this is Bradley from Race Beacon, and pre-season testing left us with a lot of questions. But if you dig deep enough into the data, it also gave us quite a lot of answers. So, with the normal caveats of, yes, it's testing, we don't know the fuel loads, blah 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 blah, all of the boring stuff that you know, we do have a decent idea of what the race pace is looking like for each team. So if you want to pretend you can predict the future, or you want one leg up in your F1 Fantasy League against your friends, take note. But anyway, like I say, normal caveat supply. Let's get right into it. We're doing reverse championship order from last season. So don't think you're getting any spoilers by what's going on down here. Because trust me, one or two of these teams might be a little bit higher. And one or two or three of these teams might be a little bit lower. So we're starting off with Williams. Obviously a rookie driver in Logan Sargent partnering Alex Albon. The car looked okay in pre-season testing. Um, they got a lot of laps in. There was no real reliability concerns. Really, for Williams, this is a transitional year. They just have to solely work on developing next year's car because they finally have the influence of their new team principal and a technical director now. So, fortunately for James Vowles, he has got a little bit of a pass this year because he is coming into a team that was last last season. No one's really expecting a lot of them. He, it's basically the dream position to be in as left on team principal media wise um maybe actual positions not so strong but on the long run pace the williams looked okay and by no means am i saying they're gonna be as bad as maybe they were two or three years ago i don't think we have a clear back marker this year i'd say if there is going to be a back marker it's probably going to be williams or alpha tarry but we'll get onto them in a minute but i think it's most likely to be williams so that's why they're going slowest so previously it was them but they're they're here again but i i think they'll be stronger than last year i think they'll probably be closer towards sort of especially like the lower midfield upper midfield um and probably join it on quite a few races a bit like they did last year i think they're just gonna have a very similar year to last year basically while logan Sargent gets used to the car and alex albon will probably pick up a couple of points but you know they probably won't end the season in double digit points so next up we have alpha Towery. and really i mean if we could put two people down here i'd probably put them here as well but i think they're just that one little step up so we're putting them in the lower midfield which in 2022 was probably about haas and alpha Towery, especially in the latter half of the year. So Alftari, we have another rookie. I mean, he's he's a seasoned rookie in Nick DeVries, partnering Yuki Tsunoda, who's only in, what, his third season in Formula 1 now. It's not a great lineup. I'm going to be brutally honest. I know a lot of people like Nick DeVries. I know a lot of people like Yuki Tsunoda, but neither of those drivers are ever going to be regular podium sitters, regular race winners, yet alone world champions. So, I mean, ironic because Nick DeVries actually is a world champion but that was a technicality with Formula E and mostly owed to an absolutely horrendous qualifying format but we'll gloss over that. Overall I think they have an okay car coming into the first race. They showed glimpses of performance running in pre-season testing and looked okay at times but their race data wasn't quite as strong as their actual performance runs were. Statistically AlphaTauri were actually the slowest cars on the race runs for average lap time but I just don't see them being the slowest car. So next up, we have the team that finished 8th in the Constructors standings last season. And they had a pretty good preseason test. And I'll tell you something else pretty good race pace data as well. So I'll explain a little bit later in this video why I think the upper midfield and the midfield columns are quite close together, if we're being brutally honest. But based on the data that we saw in testing, Haas have got to go into the midfield column for now. Their race pace looked very promising and they actually came out sixth overall. So it's not looking too bad for Haas at all. And they have two very good drivers. Obviously, you have Hulkenberg coming back from a couple of years out the sport and that will hurt him. But as he's shown in his substitute appearances, he still did a great job. And Hulkenberg is a great addition to the team compared to, I believe, Mick Schumacher from last season. And he will be right up there with Kevin Magnussen consistently competing against each other. Not really 100% relevant to this video, but I do think the battle at Haas will be one to keep an eye out for this year because those two do have a little history. They seem great chums now, but if they're having a particularly poor year or or if they're fighting for you know, maybe some more higher end points a little bit more regularly, the tension could start to boil over. And we have seen that at Haas before, and that is the last thing they will want. But nonetheless, I'm putting them in the midfield pack for now. But as you'll see, this is going to stack up quite quickly. So next up, we have Aston Martin, and they are straight away going in the upper midfield. In Bahrain testing, they came third. Yep, third. 
when it comes to the race pace data. And it just looks so good for Aston Martin. I mean, they're not at the same level as Ferrari and Red Bull, but like I say, we'll discuss them a little bit later on. They're not at that level, but they're looking pretty damn good and they have made a great step. They've made by far the biggest step forward out of any team on the grid. And it's no surprise, as I've said on my streams repeatedly, they need to get better year after year after year for at least the next three years. They have to be making strides. They've got the influence of new staff coming in now. Next year, they'll have the influence of new facilities. And then a year after that, they'll have a full year of the new facilities being online, all the staff being properly gelled. They've just got to get better at least for the next three years and they probably will. So if you're an Aston Martin fan, I say this is a pretty damn good sign and they will, I really believe this weekend in Bahrain, they have a very, very real opportunity, at least with Fernando Alonso. Obviously Lance Stroll hasn't had time in that car yet and he will be racing, that was confirmed today, but obviously Lance hasn't had the time in the car that Fernando has. Fernando could well be on track to beat at least one of the Mercedes cars this weekend. And at very worst, I would say it's looking like they are going to be top of the midfield. Unless Alpine can really spring a surprise on us, but like I say, we'll discuss them in a little bit. I really believe Fernando Alonso will be the best of the rest this weekend and potentially trying to break into the top six battle as well. I wouldn't be shocked. Next up, we have the sixth place team in last year's constructor standings with Alfa Romeo. Now, overall on the race runs, they were the fifth quickest car, but that is a slightly inflated figure, I believe, because of what went wrong with McLaren and Alpine. So for me, they're going into the midfield battle. They'll be thereabouts, but I think they might be at the lower end of it, along with Haas. Really, the... You can make the argument that Haas and Alfa Romeo could go into the lower midfield section of how stacked it's going to be. But I really do think, especially this weekend, they will be in contention, or at least the first couple of weekends, with the McLarens, with the Alpines, that sort of battle. They're not going to be at the level of Aston Martin and the teams above them, but we'll get onto that in a minute. It just looks good. They definitely step up on the Williams and the Alfa and I think the Alfa is definitely a step up on the Williams. So that's why they're going into the midfield column for now. And they're probably about even with Haas. I do think Haas have a better driver pairing as a whole, but Valtteri Bottas out of the four drivers in those two teams is probably the highest performer. So Alfa Romeo probably have the strongest and weakest driver, whereas Haas have the second and third strongest. And I wouldn't be shocked at all if it's a season-long battle between Haas and Alfa Romeo. And honestly, I think it'll just come down to who can tweak their setup the best for Bahrain, which car suits Bahrain the best. Because, like I say, it's just so close between them. So now we're moving into the top half of the constructor standings from last year, and we have McLaren. As a McLaren fan, pre-season testing was pretty rough. Um, I don't think it could have gone much worse. I mean, yeah, the Honda days with breaking down every five minutes were quite bad, but really this test was just embarrassing. They didn't get any of the long run data that they wanted in, and it just makes them very hard to gauge in general. Now, this is going purely off of what the vibes are in the media from the team, because we simply didn't see enough of that car on track to make an educated guess. Their longest run was about 10 laps on a set of C3 tyres, and that is just fairly meaningless data at the moment. So I think the best we can do with them is pop them into the midfield, assume that they're struggling early on this season. But Lando Norris was out in the media today saying, oh, it's okay, it's not as bad as it looks. You know, some people are predicting we're going to be last. That won't be the case. It's not as bad as some people are saying. And I'm taking that as an encouraging sign, and that's the reason they are sitting in the midfield for this weekend. Honestly, I was very close to putting them in lower midfield based on what we saw in testing. But the vibes from the team over the last day or two have seemed a little bit more positive. So... Fingers crossed. So if we take into account a Piastri fairly poor race, potentially because it's his first race in Formula 1, and Lando Norris just doing his normal pretty great stuff, I think it's more than fair to put them in the midfield. They're probably going to beat one of the Haas or Alfa Romeo, but I think this first race, they're going to be pretty close. I think anyone in this midfield column, honestly, I think it's going to be really close this weekend. So we're, gonna add, we're even adding another team to this in a second. So it's a really stacked tier. Next, we have Alpine, who just edged McLaren at the end of the 2022 season. And I'm popping them into the midfield. The race pace looked okay in pre-season testing. I think they were about 6th or 7th quickest. But I just think they were holding so much back. They came out incredibly bullish at their car launch, saying they wanted to be closer to 3rd than they are to 5th at the end of the season. And I think they're going to struggle to even hold 4th, given how strong that Aston Martin looks at the moment. The advantage I think they have is that both of their drivers, I would say, are better than Lance Stroll. So that could give them an in, potentially. But Fernando Alonso, I see him picking up so many best of the rest finishes this season. Alpine might find it hard to hold on to the back of Aston Martin. A lot of people this weekend are most excited to see what Aston Martin could do, but honestly, I think I'm more excited 
excited to see what Alpine can do. Mostly because we already have a general idea of what Aston Martin could do. They're going to be quick. They're going to do well. Like I say, they were seventh quickest in the race runs in Bahrain. They're not going to be the seventh quickest team come this weekend. So... Yeah, this is a fun one. I want to see what they get up to. Now we're moving on to third place in last year's constructor standings with Mercedes. And I'm just going to get right in there and move them into the upper midfield. I don't think I can label them challengers this weekend. I just don't think that's going to happen. The race pace data wasn't great. They were fourth on the race pace. And even on softer compounds were nowhere near what the Red Bull could do. Especially when it came to the performance runs. I do think Mercedes are going to have the best development curve out of any team on the grid this season but they might be starting from a slightly low point. The car just looked incredibly loose on traction and through the fast corners. Overall, it just didn't look that great to drive and they definitely didn't get it tuned during the Bahrain test itself. So Mercedes, simply on the fact that I don't think we could call them challengers this weekend, are going to go in the same tier in that upper midfield with Aston Martin. And like I say, I think Fernando Alonso, I wouldn't be shocked if he does beat one of the Mercedes drivers this weekend. But like I say, Mercedes, I think, will have the strongest development curve out of any team on the grid this season. And by the end of the year, they'll probably have a good few tenths on Aston Martin. Obviously, it remains to be seen what Aston Martin can do development-wise over the course of a season with Dan Fallows. And I'm really interested to see how that turns out. Next up, we have Ferrari, and they're going into challengers because, well, they are the challengers. Much like they were at many races, especially in the latter half of last season. But it's looking a little bit more promising. Their car, I think, overall might be a little bit weaker than the Red Bull. But this season, the Ferrari power unit is going to be able to run at a much higher power setting, hopefully reliability pending like they did at the start of last season. Obviously, there was a couple of disastrous races where they had several DNFs in the first half of the season, and that's just not on. They're hoping that this season, because of the amount of breakdowns that happened, they obviously had a lot of room to improve with the engine freeze regulations allowing for reliability upgrades for this season. So reliability upgrades should be setting in. And Ferrari, I think, will be up there. I really do. I wouldn't be shocked if Ferrari win. I'm picking them as the challengers, but I really, really wouldn't be shocked if Ferrari win. I think Charles Leclerc is the favourite in the team out of him and Carlos Sainz to sort of create a Red Bull sandwich, I guess, and get right in the middle of it and try to compete with the Red Bulls this weekend. But overall, Red Bull are just looking a little bit too strong. So they're going right at the top. And the reason I'm not as concerned about Red Bull being at the top for the sake of a competitive season as I was maybe, you know, last year, especially in the latter half of last year, is because Red Bull do, of course, have much limited CFD and wind tunnel time. And they will probably have one of the weakest development curves out of any team in the top four. So, obviously, the top three tiers on this list. So, honestly, I'm not completely fussed if Max Verstappen wins about one third, two thirds of the first, let's say, six or seven races. Because I do believe, especially come sort of any point beyond halfway through the season, you're going to have Ferrari, they'll be bringing upgrades, and Fred Vasseur's already said that Ferrari need to be much more aggressive in their mid-season upgrades, so let's assume we're going to see that this year, and let's assume they work. Um, and then, of course, Mercedes, we know what they can do to improve a car throughout the season, and Aston Martin under Dan Fallows will remain to see but they've got the facilities and they've got the money and they are a team on the up so let's say Red Bull have the weakest development curve of the top four I don't think it's a massive concern but for this weekend specifically on your F1 fantasy team get Max Verstappen in and have him as your DRS driver because I'm expecting a worst case scenario second in qualifying and the race and I think that's worst case scenario assuming he doesn't break down maybe he could be beaten by a Ferrari he should have Perez in his locker that should not be a concern at all obviously like I say Charles Leclerc probably the biggest threat to that but just get Max in your team so there we have it this is the expected order for the Bahrain Grand Prix based on all of the data that we've got so far obviously we're only going to get more accurate as this season goes on this is probably the least accurate will be all season but honestly I'm pretty happy with all of these obviously like I say a driver could make a breakout performance and move it up or down a tier you know a lot of things can happen there based on actual driver form but on the pure car performance, I'm really happy with this. And if you are playing F1 Fantasy this year or you want to be in with the chance of winning a trophy and a high five virtually from me, 
then you can join our F1 Fantasy League. The link is on screen right now and the link is also in the description. So if you want to join, we have prizes for that come the end of the year. And it was really competitive. I think we had about a thousand teams last year. It was absolutely ridiculous. So if you haven't joined already and you want your chance to win a trophy, it also gives you a chance to sort of directly compete against me. And I just think that's pretty fun. I love going up against you guys when it comes to sort of prediction F1 Fantasy stuff. And we'll be doing a lot of prediction things on stream as well. So make sure you tune into our pre-qualifying and pre-race streams. Anyway, guys, I think we'll have a video up on Friday, so probably see you tomorrow. But if not, see you for the stream on Saturday before qualifying. Hope you all enjoy this weekend and hope to see you around, like I say, on the live streams. Goodbye.